Good to see y'all. Glad to be back. Yeah, so it's, you know what's funny? The other services didn't care that I was back, so I appreciate the love. You know what I'm saying? It's like another day at the office, you know. It's all good. Now, me and Angela are good. We were out the last couple of weeks with the Rona, and uh, we, had a, we had a fairly mild experience, thanks to the Lord. And uh, really, we're just tired still. And so I'll probably sit down for a lot of our chat, but I wanted to make sure I saved enough in the tank to make sure that uh, to make sure that I had plenty of energy for this group as well. So I didn't I didn't I didn't burn it all burn up all the fuel on the last two. So man, it's good to see y'all. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Philippians chapter two. Put your finger in there, and then go about two or three pages to your right to Colossians chapter one. Uh, that's where we'll end up landing for our discussion today in this say what series. Uh, before I jump over there, though, I, I really want to celebrate. Uh, just, we, we have an incredible team here, GBC. Just an incredible team. I mean, from staff to volunteers, deacons, elders, like it's just, man, it, it's a small army that does so much stuff. And some of which I forgot to tell, it's Kids Life Fam Jam Weekend, and they're in here worshiping with us. So now kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, take off. Get on out of here. All right? We love y'all, but you're going to enjoy being with them better than you will with me. All right, uh, forgot about that. Uh, so many great things going on here, I can't remember everything that's going on. Uh, so I wrote it down because uh, I wanted to celebrate a few things with y'all because unless you had some sort of involvement in one of the things I'm going to mention to you, you wouldn't have known that it's happening. Um, and so, like, I mean, let me start here. It's last weekend, this was awesome to me. So I'm laid up at the house, can't really do a daggum thing. Of course, I got to see y'all online, which was pretty cool. Uh, production team put that miracle together. Um, so last Friday, Etienne, the student ministry team, put together an event called The Switch, which is it's something we do every year. It's gone by different names over the years. But essentially, we take fifth graders that are transiting in, transitioning into sixth grade, and we do this event for them uh, where it's an opportunity to help prepare them for middle school call it the switch. It's just getting ready uh, to go from, from you know, the, the big jump of life from fifth grade to sixth grade. So that was happening on Friday. At the same time, Pastor Cameron and the abide, some of the abide pastors were out at Avon Park State Prison beginning a two-day conference with the inmates that are a part of the abide church at the prison, which is to the tune of about 150 guys. Um, that was two days, Friday and Saturday, uh, Pastor Cam leading that conference with the Abide community of pastors. Now, now that we got to Saturday, prison conference is still happening, all right? Um, our children's ministry team does a child dedication event here at the church where we have about 10 different uh, kids, families that were wanting to just dedicate their child to the Lord. It doesn't save the kid. Um, it really is about the families looking at Jesus square in the eye and saying, we are going to commit this child to you, and we're going to raise this child in such a way with the hope that one day they will choose to follow you like we do. That's what child dedication is. It's not saving babies. Babies can't get, they don't understand Jesus yet. So we, we dedicate them to the Lord, and we, and we try to come around the parents uh, to equip them and challenge them. Now, historically, we have done that like from the stage during a weekend worship service, which is awesome, because then the whole church family gets to be a part of it. But the downfall to that is it becomes kind of a sub point. It's like a footnote of the service because it's just a part of the service. So we wanted to do something where like that was the focal point, loving on the families, having a meal, celebrating the families, equipping the families, dedicating the children. So that happened on Saturday, all right, while we were doing the conference out at the prison, that was happening in here, and our children's team put that on. Now on Sunday, our elder team was leading, listen to this, <clears throat> This doesn't even include the Spanish ministry that's happening in the First Baptist. Geez, that was going on too. In addition to that, our elder team was leading six church services at three different churches all at the same time. Um, Pastor Cam and company was here leading our GBC family in our weekend of worship. Dewey was in Lake Placid, uh, filling in, preaching for uh, South Oak and Lake Placid because both their pastors were down. Etienne was in Okeechobee at Oakview, leading and loving on that church family. Six different church services all happening at one time uh, that our elders got to lead on Sunday. But wait, that, that's not all. Pastor Chris and some of our Stevens ministry team leaders end up 
at Heartland Highlands Hospital on Sunday night, praying for, caring for, and ministering to the ICU staff late that evening, loving on them. All right, in addition to that, one of our deacons hops on an airplane, flies down to Haiti to go down to Haiti Bible Mission to figure out what some of the greatest needs are that we can partner with as a church family. All this is happening all at the same time last weekend with about a 48-hour period, and I barely even got up out of bed. So I want to celebrate the staff and team and leaders and volunteers we have at this church family. It's awesome, man. Isn't that cool? It's just awesome. Like, it is so neat how, how the Lord has equipped us, but is also giving us opportunity to utilize our people resources to make big kingdom investment all around us all the time. And we're just a small microcosm of the body of Christ. That doesn't even go on to mention, like I mentioned, the, the uh, Hispanic church that's happened at First Baptist. There's so much kingdom stuff happening all over the world all at once. And this is how God orchestrates us. It doesn't boil down to just a few faithful people. It is the body of Christ living on mission together that can have a huge reach into the world around us. And I just love those handful of things that our staff and team pulled off within just a couple of days. So very proud of that stuff. So if you see them, love on them, encourage them, cheer for them. As a matter of fact, so Pastor Cam's over at Oakview right now and Okeechobee loving on them, ministering there today. I get uh, letters and texts and phone calls from people from Okeechobee. Um, just so grateful. If you don't know what's happening over there, uh, one of the good-sized church, I mean, his church is about 150 people on the weekend. Their pastor passed away unexpectedly a little over a month ago. And so we've jumped in to be what we in church business call pulpit supply. So we're essentially doing the weekend preaching for them. And uh, for who knows how long, while they're trying to find a new pastor. And so we kind of have a rotation of communicators that go down there every weekend. Cam's down there right now. <clears throat> um, but I get really sweet encouragement letters I want to share with y'all because it's something we're doing as a church family. And I've seen several dozen of you down there uh, at Oakview loving on those people, going out to them with meals, getting to know names, praying with those folks. We got GBC family in Okeechobee this weekend too. Uh, we're just wrapping our arms around that church family during this tough time. So here's a couple cards that I just wanted to share with y'all because it's written to us as a church. Uh, first one is Grace Baptist Church. <laughs> Some of y'all just caught that. <clears throat> we're not Grace Baptist Church. We're, we're Grace Bible Church, which we just kind of inherited that name. <clears throat> Grace Baptist Church and any of the other churches and pastors in the Sebring area, uh, how we love you. You came to Oakview Baptist to pastor for Oakview. You came to help support us in our loss of Brother John. The Lord opened heaven's gates and took our blessed sweet John. He wanted... Another beautiful rose for his garden. John would, John would love you all for what you are doing for Oakview. Also, you fed us food on Sunday. So two weeks ago, one of our deacon teams went down there and cooked a barbecue lunch for the entire church, which was amazing. We didn't ask them to. They just decided that's how they wanted to serve the Oakview family. So, of course, you know, you know whether or not they like Cameron's preaching two weeks ago, they loved a barbecue. <laughs> You fed us on Sunday. It was wonderful. You guys are wonderful. Uh, I have never seen churches do this in my 83 years. Isn't that pretty cool? Kingdom of God. That's capital C stuff right there. Isn't that exciting? Got another one right here. Yeah. <clears throat> it says, Dear Grace Bible Church. Different church than that one, apparently. <laughs> I am... A member at Oakview Baptist Church, I wanted to thank you so much for being here for us during our transition to find a pastor for our church. I am praying that God will send us a leader like the ones that he has sent us these last several weeks. Thank you also for the wonderful luncheon that you provided for us. Isn't that pretty cool, man? I love when we get to do stuff like that. Awesome. You know, we've been in a series right now called Say What? And we've been talking about the weird stuff Christians say. Now, I'd, as much as I would love to do an entire series that would take months and months on all of the weird things Christians say, because we say a lot of weird stuff, um, these things we're talking about really are the weird things that we say that are actually biblical, that have actually 
haven't come down the line of, from centuries of church tradition. These have actually come right out of the Word of God. These strange things that we say, these, these phrases and words that like for the average church attender or even average onlooker that's trying out church, they hear us say these things and it's kind of like, say what? Like what, what does that mean? Some really beautiful, mysterious and true things of us because of what Jesus has done for us, like, like gospel, like what does that mean, why does it matter? We talked about that. We talked about what it meant to be uh, when the Bible tells us um, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Really mysterious language, but if you could understand what that means, it would change your life. So we spent a whole weekend talking about what it means to be the righteousness of Christ and how his work has made us righteous before God. And so we can learn how to walk in these things. We talked about what it meant to be indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. Another weird thing Christians say for the average church attender, it's like, what, what do you mean? Like, how does that work? What is that, how does that matter for my life? So we've talked about some really mysterious but powerful gospel truths over these last six weeks or so. And so today's going to be the last conversation in the Say What series, and then we'll be transitioning next week into a new conversation called Come to Me. And we're going to look at when Jesus invites us to come to him uh, for rest and weariness when we need peace. Um, but this, this last part of the conversation, quite honestly, is it's almost kind of flipping things around because it very much is the summary, a, a summary conversation of all the things we've talked about the last couple years as we've been reorienting our church family around the gospel and reorienting our lives around our identity in Christ Jesus and what all that means for us. And so this last one, we're going to really be looking at the most mysterious phrase of all, particularly here in the Bible Belt, Southeast. And that phrase is, <clears throat> I believe. Oh, you do? You believe what? You know, we here in a post-Christian culture here in the U.S. of A, is, and it, particularly here in the Bible Belt Southeast and right here even in the heart of Florida, like here in Highlands County and even in this church, like there's a lot of people, not everybody, but there are a lot of people, at least more per capita than there would be in other parts of the country that would, that would say like, yes, I am a believer, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, and all that stuff. Okay. Um, so it's really not a question of like, <clears throat> um, do we have a lot of believers? The question is, is what is it that they are actually believing? Because if you ask, if I pulled y'all aside individually and asked, what is it that you believe? I would probably get about 175 different what you believes. You see what I'm saying? And there's a lot of reasons why that is, but like... <clears throat> I think what's happening this weekend is I'm not really here to teach us anything. I think I'm really here to ask you a question and give you some bumpers to think about it through. I, th I think I'm asking, do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and King? And what, a, what is it that you believe about him? Because there's only one right answer, just so you know. It's not really subject to debate or interpretation. Like, and just so that we wouldn't get confused, <clears throat> he has described himself all throughout Scripture just so that we would know exactly what it was like. And just to make sure we knew for certain what he was like, he actually showed up and lived with us for 33 years. Yeah, God lived amongst us so that we wouldn't have to ask the question, well, I wonder what it would be like if God lived here. I wonder how God would handle this situation or what it would be like to like, have a meal with God. Well, we know. We know. The problem is, even after all of that, like, because of our, ultimately our biblical illiteracy, like, there are many who claim to believe, but they're believing in something that's not real. And if you're not believing in the right and true version of who Jesus is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you, you, is, you is as lost as anybody that outright rejects him. You got to know the king of glory, who he is, and submit your life to him to be saved. And, and I don't want us, we, we make, it's so dangerous here in the South, especially in the South. It's so dangerous here because we assume the gospel in the lives of people that we like 
and love because they're nice folks and they'll say things like, well, the man upstairs and they may pray at dinner every now and then. And like, we just kind of assume that those people in our lives that say that they believe actually believe in the one true king of glory and have submitted their lives to him. And if I could just be frank with you, I am so sick and tired of lying at people's funerals. I mean, it's not my place to, ju- I can't see the heart of a man to know if he knows Jesus or not. But all I can tell you is, and I'll give you some statistical evidence that, like, there are many who are under the illusion because they have some truisms or some truish idea of what the gospel is and who Jesus is, but they know not the king of glory, and they are in trouble, man. And I'm going to be honest with you, it ain't just them out there. And it ain't just people on the West Coast. And it ain't just people in the Middle East. It's people in Highlands County. It's people at Grace Bible Church. You you know, this, Ansley actually brought this up. She's the one, say what was actually her idea. She was saying, Dustin, you say some things so often when you preach, and it just kind of rolls off your tongue like common speak, but it's like very mysterious language. We need to take some time to really help our church family, like, see what those things mean so that they can learn to walk in those and grow up into those truths for their life. And this, I believe conversation really kind of, really was kind of prompted by our own personal relationships and experience. This isn't some interaction with y'all that I've said, you know what, people at Grace Bible have no idea who Jesus is. This is, this happened because of people that we love. You know, it wasn't too long ago, and honestly, it's not all that uncommon, but it was in the not too recent past, we went to a wedding for a family that we've known for a long time. We were just there to attend because we love them. And like, here is the most sacred moment in this couple's lives. And, and, they, and they would confess to be believers in Christ. They're not involved in church or not, in, you know, they don't do any of that. But like, they would confess, they would say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're believers. We, if I did their funeral, they'd be telling me, yeah, so-and-so was, you know, knew Jesus. And, but here I am observing the most sacred moment of their life not only the most sacred moment of their life, but a gift that God has given us called marriage that is like a a way for us to experience on earth, to be able to witness on earth kind of how Jesus' covenant with us works as Christians. So it's pretty typical, even for people that are like, have really no interest in God whatsoever, like it's pretty typical in an environment like that for, you know, there to be a prayer or Jesus to be acknowledged or God to be acknowledged in some way. Well, at this particular service, it, it, was, it, was, it was not even, there was no prayer, there was no acknowledgement of Jesus whatsoever. And these are people we've known for a long time. And so here I am kind of stunned. I didn't even feel like I had attended a, the wedding. It's like we're missing like the whole other part of this. And I remember sitting there just like grieving in my heart because like, Our families have known each other forever, and like we have just assumed, like because they confess that they are believers, that they know the Lord. And to be honest with you, I don't know. There's conversations we've talked about and prayed about having in in the coming days because of that experience. I'm like, man, you know, and I, we have dear friends that are well traveled. You know, they spend a lot of time uh, traveling about the world, and because of that, it has really shaped their worldview because they've, you know, they've they've lived with different people groups around the world for different. Uh, lengths of time to just really get a grasp on what the world is like. And they also confess to be believers in Jesus, but when they speak of the Lord or speak of Christ, like it is kind of like this hodgepodge mix up of all the experiences they've had with other world religions. And Jesus just kind of like at the top, you know what I'm saying? Instead of being the only, he's just kind of like the best version of everything else. But You know, everybody else kind of gets included, kind of that universalist look. And, like, we just started to be burdened because I tell you, as we've been calling you guys to live on mission, recognize you're a missionary wherever God has placed you in your neighborhood, at your workplace, with your friend group. We, too, have been asking God how to do that. So now we, we vacation differently now. We have... Our relationships with our close friend group is different now because we're, we're asking God for opportunities just to make little microscopic gospel deposits as we go. And in doing so, like approaching our relationships differently now, there's a certain awareness. I'm like, man, like they, they, can, they, they confess to believe in Jesus, but they don't know him, so they obviously can't believe in him. We got to know what it is that we believe in, right? I mean, is that, is that like too far-fetched to say? You can't believe in something you don't you don't know what it is, you know what I'm saying? I tell you, like, 
It's just a dangerous place that the world has gotten. And I don't want to assume the gospel in the people's lives that I love. I don't want, and you guys are a part of that. I don't want our church family to assume it in their own lives. Like, I'm really asking you this weekend, do you know him? And do you believe? And I'm, I'm just trusting God to prompt you to ask the same question in your heart of those who he has placed in your circle. Because there is only one true king of glory, and his name is Jesus. And calling something that is not him Jesus doesn't count. You know, <clears throat> let me give you an example. Like here, Here's just, this, this would be a good place to start. You can be absolutely certain. I want to make sure we're thinking through the right lens here. You can be absolutely certain that if the Jesus that you know loves everything that you love, hates everything that you hate, and pretty much in a roundabout way just agrees with everything that you believe, I guarantee to rest assured you made him up. He ain't real. You're believing in a, a lie, a false God, an idol that you conjured up in your imagination. I, I tell you what has happened. The, the more I grow in my spiritual maturity, the more time I spend in the Word, the more I declare the word of God and understand like who Jesus is, the more I realize that like my impulses and my preferences oftentimes don't agree with God. That's just part of me understanding who he is. I'm recognizing the big gap between who I am and the holiness of God that Jesus had to span the bridge between us because quite honestly, and I'm, even now, like even as, a, even as your pastor, I will confess to you that how I feel about certain things and what I believe to be true are not always the same. I know that is very foreign for most people. Because most folks believe whatever it is that they feel, and that fits all in one package. And if that's the case, your feelings are liars, if you haven't noticed yet. Your feelings are not the best truth teller in your life. And so as you grow up in your relationship with the Lord, you just start to understand man, how I feel about certain things and what I actually believe about them. They don't always line up. So I spend a lot of time like submitting my feelings to the Lord. How I feel about certain socio-political issues, how I feel about, you know, certain scenarios. Like case in point, like I want to believe that every nice guy that I've ever met that I like is going to end up in heaven one day. That's how I feel. I feel like that's good. But the Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through him. So how I feel about somebody and what is the reality of their spiritual condition, they're not always the same thing. Case in point. Um, so anyway, I don't want you to believe a lie. If the Jesus that you know agrees with you on all counts, you don't know Jesus. You have an imaginary friend that you call Jesus. Don't think that the magnitude of the holiness of God is in any way going to submit himself and kowtow to our preference. Here, here's, some, here's the world that you live in. Uh, some of y'all have heard of the Barna Group study. We're going to get the scriptures here in just a minute. So I want you to see Jesus just setting us up so we think about it. Uh, some of y'all heard of the Barna Groups, like a national survey, just kind of gets an idea how people feel about this or how people are handling that situation or what they're doing in their life or how many, you know, people are in their household. Barna is a big deal. Uh, the, the, the Christian world has something similar. I, I believe it's pronounced the, the Ligonier survey. I probably said that wrong. But anyway, they, they put out a state of theology survey every year, and they interview um, thousands and thousands of people all over the U.S. They, they ask the same questions to the people who would say that they are not believers in Jesus as they do the people who say that they are, all right? So th they'll ask, you know, uh, atheists, agnostics, or folks that just don't really know what they believe. They'll ask all of them the same questions they ask the Christians. And then they'll kind of weigh those out so you can see kind of the difference between the Christian worldview and the worldview around you. But what's interesting is when you look at the Christian worldview, the evangelical Christian worldview, in other words, evangelical that, that, um, that there is a message of gospel truth and it comes from the word of God and the message is about Jesus, evangelical, okay? Hold on, let me cough. And so for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you just a few of the things that Christians 
uh, believe around the country, evangelical Christians. Remember, I'm not just talking about them out there. I'm talking about people in Highlands County. I'm talking about people in this building right now. I just, I just picked three that I thought were interesting, okay? So Ligonier makes a statement, and then you get a chance to respond if you strongly agree, somewhat agree, not sure, disagree, so on and so forth. So here, here's what the deal. Here was the statement. Modern science disproves the Bible, all right? 17% of evangelical Christians agreed with that. Modern science disproves the Bible. So that's one in five, roughly. One in five people that say, yes, I believe, believe that modern science has disproved the Bible. What's funny, I, I could have a <clears throat> more lengthy conversation with you, but the interesting thing is science is still trying to get caught up to what the Bible's been teaching for centuries when it comes to health care, when it comes to mental health, all that stuff. Uh, but keep in mind, the Bible's not a science book, but when it speaks of science, it speaks accurately, and it always has. You get what I'm saying? The Bible's not a history book, but when it speaks of history, it speaks accurately. You get what I'm saying? One in five Christians believe that modern science has dis... Christians, evangelical Christians, believe that modern science has disproved the Bible. Okay, you obviously don't believe. All right, here's another one. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 30%, one in three, one out of every three evangelical Christians statistically believe Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. It's, I didn't make this up. It's people just like you and me answering this. And don't be shocked. We did this as a church a couple of years ago. We did a whole series called This I Believe. And we asked all the same Ligonier questions to our church family. It didn't look any different than theirs. We're here. We need to have this conversation. I want to make sure you know who Jesus is and what it is that you believe in, or choosing not to believe in for that matter, because one in three people who say, I believe, believe Jesus was a great guy, but he was not God. C.S. Lewis put it best. Jesus was either a lunatic, a liar, or he was Lord. It's either true, everything that he said, or he was the greatest lunatic and liar of history. You can't be a good teacher or a good prophet and claim to be God and claim that you are the king of the world and claim that the only way to be made right with God is to believe. He's either a psycho or he's God. There is no in-between. He didn't leave any room for debate. You have to be totally for him or totally against him. Well, one in every three Christians believe that Jesus was a great guy, but he ain't God. You better believe Jesus was a lunatic then. You can't be a good teacher and say those preposterous things that Jesus did. One in three. It's not just out there, it's in here. How about this? Um, God accepts the worship of all religions. Like all religions, doesn't matter. Islam, doesn't matter. God accepts the worship of all religions. 42% of evangelical Christians agree with that statement. You know how many that is? Every other one, statistically, around the country, every other person that says, yeah, I believe, believe that the holy God, the one and only true king who has told us that there is none before me, there is none beside me, there is none like me, thou shalt have no other God other than me, that he's okay with us worshiping whatever other false idol or figment of our imagination that we have, and he's just going to kind of assume that as, well, they don't understand, but they're really worshiping me. No, you ain't. There's only one. One, every other evangelical Christian, 42%. I didn't come up with that stuff. That was interviewing thousands of Christians around the country. You know what's scary about this is like, <clears throat> Let me be honest with you, like, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Being in Sunday school or a Bible study or going on mission trip, like, none of, that, none of that makes you a Christian. But here's the problem. If you're not putting yourself in those environments or environments like it, where people are gathering together, opening up the Word of God, Studying it together in the accountability of a crowd of people so that you can say to me, Dustin, what you said was wrong. So that I can say to you, man, you, you, that's not what the Bible teaches. Look what it says. Like, if you're not regularly gathering, you online people, listen up. 
like if you're not regularly gathering in groups of people to study and understand the word of God so that you can see him more clearly, who he is, who you are in light of who he is, what you need to do to honor him with your life, like if you're not finding it in the word of God through regular ongoing study, and ask anybody that's walked with the Lord for a long time and studied the Bible for a long time, like the more I do it, the more I realize I don't even know. So you can't just have like a one-time experience and think that, okay, I got it. I'm just going to move on from there. Like it is a, the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. Like it's constantly, constantly changing and shaping me as I look at it, as I understand Jesus better. What's scary is if going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you're Christian doesn't mean you get into Bible studies or into Sunday school classes. But if you're not getting in those regular environments where the word of God is being opened and taught well, what will happen and what has happened, you just saw the stats, is we will naturally just kind of drift backwards towards seeing Jesus as the sum total of what our grandma said about him, what that one Christian song that we really like said about him, how that Christian movie portrayed him, and ultimately the sum total of what I want him to be like. And let me tell you, if you're guessing, you've guessed wrong. You have definitely missed it. There's no way that the vastness of the glory of God and his love story and his sacrifice and his holiness could ever be discovered through the the bounds of our imagination and a couple of Christian songs. It is a lifetime of discovering his majesty that has to happen through his work. He didn't leave us here to guess. He told us what he was like all throughout the scriptures. He showed up so that we could experience what he was like. I mean, what else is he supposed to do? But yet we believe all kind of nonsense. Let's look at a couple places in the word where he actually describes himself. And I want to ask you, do you believe in this? This is God on God. This is Jesus on Jesus. Colossians chapter 1. This is one of many places. I'm going to give you two, ten verses, two locations. This is just two of many things in the Bible that speak of the Lord and what he's like so that you know what to believe in. And here's how Paul describes it to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul. I'll read through these and then we'll chop them up in a few minutes. He is, who's he, by the way? The best Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body. That's the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. Say preeminent. That means first place. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him... To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Go back a couple of pages. That Jesus, the one who is first place in all things, who is the ruler and champion of everything spiritual and physical, who is the creator of all things, who is the one who sacrificed himself for us, that king of glory who sits on the throne of heaven, Also, just so you know, verse 6 of Philippians chapter 2, even though he was in the form of God, he was God in the flesh, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. What kind of king, what kind of God does that? This is how he did it. He was born in the likeness of men. He was found in human form. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. 
so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Say that with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. With a little more gusto, Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. These are two little snapshots, ten verses, two locations of who Jesus is. Do you believe him? Do you know him? You know, he says some things in Colossians that as much as we'd love to say, man, I don't know that we actually like or believe. And I can tell you, many of the folks on this and many of the folks that would say that they believe don't believe in the Jesus of Colossians chapter 1. Let me give you some examples. This is how he introduces himself. He says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In the Greek, that word image in their language is the word icon. Guess what English word we get from the Greek word icon? Icon. Very good. You know what an icon is? You know, y'all got smartphones. Some of y'all, you flip it open and you see these icons for the app that you have. It's saying that Jesus is the icon for the invisible God. He is the living, breathing image of it. In him is where you find God. This icon is simply just the front door of everything that this icon offers. It, the icon and the program, they are one. The icon simply is just the, the physical representation of everything that you can't see yet. Unless you access it. And then it opens up everything. Jesus is saying, he is the icon. He is the image of the invisible God. The fullness of God dwells in him completely. And the way to knowing God and to experiencing God is through him. He's the icon. He's the way in. He is God. He's the physical representation of everything that that icon represents. God himself. But also I want you to notice it says he is the image of the invisible God. The, you know what that means? There's just one. There's not a few, and there ain't a variety of ways that God has chosen to display himself to the world. He is the icon, the only one. And this is why John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It capitalizes W in Word every time in John 1.1. 1, 1. If you wonder what the Word is, it jumps down. John 1.14 says, and so the Word put on flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the Word? John describes Jesus as the capital W, the Word of God. And the Word was there with him for all time since the beginning. And the Word is with God. And he says, and the Word was God. Jesus and him have been the same guy. Jesus is just God putting on skin. But there's some Bible translations and even local churches in our community that use these Bible translations that change John 1.1, 1, 1, one of the most foundational truths in all the Word of God. You know, the Jehovah's Witness, and depending on the translation of the Mormon Bible you look at, it describes Jesus in John 1.1. 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You see how one, can you tell the difference between the word was God and the word was a God? You see how adding just one little letter changes the whole meaning of that passage? And can completely miss the point on who Jesus is. He's not a God. He's not a good prophet or a good teacher. He is God who showed up for us. And he's been there all along. He always was, and he currently is, and he always will be God. Jesus, he was also the firstborn of all creation. Now that sounds interesting, Jesus being born. So God created Jesus first and then created everything else after that. Now, when you read about firstborn, it's not speaking about chronological birth, like Jesus was born first. It's speaking of Jesus as the son of promise. The firstborn son would be the one who has the, the promise of the firstborn. Everything that is the father's, all of his wealth, all of his reputation, all of his power, it's given to the firstborn. 
This is just a reminder to us that Jesus, not only is he God, but he has access to and everything that is God is Jesus. He was the firstborn of all creation. All things are him and all things are his. And for by him, just so you know what he's talking about, for by him all things were created. He wasn't created, he created all things. By him all things were created in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. Let me summarize that for you. Jesus is the king of everything spiritual and supernatural. Everything invisible, he's the king of. He's the king of all the angels, including the fallen ones. He's the king of everything spiritual or supernatural that may be happening in the world around us or in your life. I, I caution you to give the devil too much credit because he ain't in charge. Jesus is the king of all of it. Not only is he the king of everything spiritual, he's the king of everything physical, according to that. Rulers, authorities, dominions. Yeah, he's the king of all the things. All the good, the bad, and the ugly that's happening in the world right now. It always raised the question for me, then why wouldn't he do something about it? If he's the king of all that. Something tells me if the world was in perfect order, nobody would be looking for a savior. It is the kindness of God to allow the dark to get darker so that the light of Christ might seem all the brighter. It's his love to allow the unraveling in the world around us. And just so that we weren't surprised, I read the end of the book and he told us it was coming. But he's the king of it. Nothing moves apart from what he says is so. He is the king. And it says that he is before all things. In other words, he's in front. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, which is the church. All of Christianity is his. It must bow to him. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He was the one that conquered death itself. And in everything, all of these things, so that he might be preeminent. Say preeminent. Yeah, that's first place. <clears throat> there ain't nothing like him, nothing beside him. No one compares. There's, there's no other gods. There's nothing even close. He's first place preeminent. He's so far in front of the pack. And that's okay for me to swallow when it comes to, like, you know, global politics and war. And as the nations rage and leaders of nations and, like, okay, Jesus is the king of all that. He's preeminent. He's first place. He's still on the throne. But it's, he's not just first place and preeminent with the big stuff. He's first place and preeminent with the microscopic things, too. You know, like, he's first place when it comes to our preferences. What we feel is right. What we want to be right. It don't matter because he's preeminent. He's first place. You know, I told you before that as I grow in my walk with Jesus, I recognize that the way I feel about certain things and what I actually believe, because the Lord said it so, they're not always the same. My feelings are in conflict with my belief and all kind of stuff. Now, that's a foreign concept because most of the world, whatever it is that they feel is the ultimate truth for them. But I told you, your feelings are liars, if you haven't noticed. And if you've forgotten, just ask your wife. Or a close friend watches you go off the handle and think, what are you doing? Like, your feelings are liars. And so as I learn what it is that God has told me to believe, I submit my feelings over and over again to the Lord and say, God, I don't, I don't feel like this is right and good, but you have said it is so. And so I'm going to bow to that. And I'm going to keep bowing that until my feelings learn how to catch up. And that takes a lifetime, doesn't it? It takes a lifetime. He's first place in our preferences. He's first place in all the things. For in him, here's why, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The 100% of God dwells in Jesus because Jesus is 100% God. 100%. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. He's the icon. He's the physical representation of everything that God is. He's been displayed through Jesus. 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Philippians 2 talks about how he made that peace and how he gave us a means of being reconciled to God, that we would stand before him justly and rightly and righteously. You can't do that by good behavior. If, if you expect to walk into the heavenlies one day and you think that God is going to allow you into heaven based off whether your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds, you might as well give up now because you've already done more bad stuff than you'll be able to make up for. So Jesus had to make a way. He had to become our ransom, our redeemer, to pay the, the Bible says the propitiation, to pay the ransom for our sins so that we could be set free. He had to do the work. We have to believe in him. That's who he said he is and what he said he's done, the way he described it, not the way our imagination told us. And Jesus humbled himself, got up off the throne of heaven. Can you imagine what heaven must have done when God got up off of his throne? The angels had been singing holy, holy, holy for eternity past, whenever he created them until still going on. We're just going to join them in the chorus one day. But when God spun the entire work of his creation into existence, he never even got up out of his chair. He just said it and it happened. Let there be, let there be. That's how powerful he is. And can you imagine the shock when God stood up off of his throne and began to take his royal robes of heaven off and announce to the angels that he was about to put on skin and move into earth so that we could kill him, so that we could be forgiven. Can you imagine the shock of heaven? That's probably the only time ever that the angels stopped and gasped for air because God has never stood up to his feet until the day came that he was going to come after us. And he got up and he walked into our story and it changed everything. And because of that, it says that God has exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Have you? Or is there still things in your life that have a higher name of authority than Jesus does? Have we? Because God did and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is a one-day promise right here. There's going to come a day when every living thing, both human and spiritual, that has been designed by God himself is going to get on their knees as Jesus takes the center stage of heaven and is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. And they all going to bow. The Taliban, they going to bow. The Dalai Lama, he's going to bow. Buddha, he's going to bow. Whatever that fake God called Allah, he's going to bow. Muhammad, he's going to bow. Satan, he's going to bow. And confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And that day's coming. But only for those who didn't wait to bow then and chose to bow now. Will they be with Jesus for all of eternity? We know that the day everybody's gonna bow their, they're gonna get on their face and they're gonna weep. 
every false god, every wicked ruler, every leader of nations, they're going to weep before Jesus. And they're going to confess that he is Lord. But only those who choose to bow now, as Scripture tells us, will be given the right to become children of God. And it is those kids who will be with him forever. And the rest will be separated from him forever. And I hate to say it, but here's the reality. Hell is going to be full of people with great church attendance. Hell is going to be full of Sunday school teachers and pastors and missionaries. It's not just bad folk. Because heaven wasn't created for good folk. It was created for the redeemed and those that recognized who Jesus is and what he has done and bowed their heart before him as king. That's who will be with him. Let me ask you again, do you know him? Do you know him the way he has declared that he is? Or have you allowed the world to raise us? Have you allowed the enemy to deposit into you these fantasies and ideologies of what you want Jesus to be like and you put your trust in that idol and you put Jesus' name on it, not recognizing that the Jesus of the ages, the King of glory has declared himself through the scripture so that we would know him and so that we could surrender our lives to him. Do you know him? Do you know him? This ain't between you and me, this is between you and the Lord. Do you believe? And let's not, y'all are the 11 o'clock, so I got a minute with you. Let's not be under any illusions that we believe in something that we don't move towards. If I ask you if you believe in bathing and you don't regularly take baths, you a liar. You don't believe in it because you don't move towards it. If I ask you if you believe in marriage and fidelity within marriage, but you're walking out on your spouse regularly, you a liar. You don't believe. Because we will always move towards what we believe. Let's not be under any illusions that if our lives have nothing to do with Jesus, if we do not care about who he is and what he has said, and we're not regularly moving towards him in his word, in worship, with his people, you're a liar. And we live in a society that is so numb to biblical, gospel-centered Christianity that you have been allowed to believe that you believe. But I don't want to lie at y'all's funeral. Do you believe in him? And do you believe in who he is and what he has done, not the version of what you had hoped for? Because if you're guessing, you're way off. Yeah. Would you stand with me? God, it is going to take a lifetime to just begin to discover your beauty and majesty, your intentions, your desires. God, it is going to take a lifetime of surrender. And God, I know one day we'll know fully well. But God, we as a people, we commit to laying our lives down before you today. We practice bowing our knees today and confessing you as Lord today. We thank you that our right standing with you is not based on our performance and good behavior, but it's based on believing you. And I know that when we believe in you rightly, it's going to change us. Oh, it's going to take some time, but it's going to change us. And I ask you, Grace Bible, as you bow your head, as you're speaking to God, 
Do you believe in him? Have you confessed that he is Lord of your life? I mean the real version of him. The one who is preeminent first before all things, who is the king above all others, who is the only way to God, who is the one true king that all the majesty and the power and authority has been bestowed upon him. Do you believe in him? Have you confessed him as Lord? And as you are praying right now, let's just confess that to him, you and him, private prayer, confessing him as Lord and King, submitting yourself and your preferences to him. Let's do that. You do that right now. you're praying about you, who's the names that come to mind of the people in your life that you love, that confess believing, but you, you know, you know that at best it's a figment of their imagination, there's no real evidence. I ain't talking about being judgy, I'm talking about you know, be honest, who, who do you love? that God has placed in your life that you just know may see themselves as one who believes but knows not the King of glory. Would you lift up their name before the Lord? And would you pray the radically dangerous prayer of asking God to use you in their life that they might see Jesus for real? You pray. You continue to pray and confess the kingship of Jesus in your life as Pastor Dave leads us in these words. Jesus, I can just imagine the moment in heaven when you take center stage and all the eyes turn on you and all the knees hit the deck. For those that are in Christ Jesus, what a glorious day that will be. For those that know you not, Father, I know that that is gonna be a day of deeper brokenness than they have ever experienced when they finally realize that you were the one. God, we need your help. We love people that don't know you. Some, of what, some confess that they don't care about you and some confess that they believe but don't know you. Uh, Lord, I, we need your help. Lord, would you rescue our loved ones? Would you, would you call them in to everlasting transformation? Would you call them into a new life in Christ? Would your Holy Spirit just lay hold of their heart right now, wherever they are, that their eyes would be open and their ears would hear the voice of their King for the first time. I pray that for us too. 
the illusions that we have believed and the lies that we have called Jesus. Lord, we see in your word who you are and we bow to that king, the real deal. God, I thank you for your love for us, your steadfast love. I thank you that you rejoice over us. I thank you that there was nothing that would stop you from coming after us. You've done the work, God. We simply need to believe and confess. Transform our hearts so that we might be a people who truly believe. And may your work change us constantly in our lives. And we love you. We celebrate you. You are good. There is none like you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said.